Hello guys, if you watched my previous video, you learned that the energy of the universe is constant. So we cannot create, we cannot destroy energy, we can only transfer the energy from one form to another. Now the question comes up, how do we measure how much energy do we have in something? Well, it's complicated. It's actually impossible to measure the absolute amount of energy in a system. It is similar to measuring how much water you have in the ocean. It would be really, really hard, right? To exactly know to milliliters how much water you have there. But if you actually pour one gallon of water into the ocean, you know that the amount of water in the ocean increased by one gallon. So similarly, the change in energy can be measured. So if you take the energy of the final minus the initial state, you will get the change in energy. The delta sign defines the change. Okay, now let's look at some definitions. What is a system? A system is simply a portion of the universe that we single out to study, okay? A system can be my pen, a system can be this little rubber dot that I have here, a system can be anything that I would like to study. Here on this slide, the system is simply defined by this red rectangle, and the blue dots inside are gas atoms, okay? And they actually move around with some velocity inside this system, okay? So they have a defined kinetic energy. Now, everything else around our system is called the surroundings. So system is the portion of the universe we are studying and the surroundings is everything else. Now what's really important is the internal energy of the system. This is the sum of all kinetic and potential energies of all components of the system. Now generally, depending on your textbook, you are going to see internal energy defined with a capital U or a capital E. In this video, I'm going to use capital E to define the internal energy. Okay, so now we know what the system is, what the surroundings is. There are actually three types of systems. We can have an open system in which we can exchange with heat and mass with the surroundings, just like this coffee cup right here. It can cool down, we can drink coffee from it, so we can exchange with heat and mass. We can have a closed system which can only exchange with heat with its surroundings, just like this water bottle. As it is closed, we can warm it up, but we cannot drink water from it. And an isolated system, which cannot exchange with heat or mass with its surroundings. And a good everyday example might be a thermos that can keep our drinks cold or hot. Obviously, this is not a perfect isolated system, but this is a good example from our everyday life. So... Let's get back to how to measure energy exactly. We know that energy is defined as the ability to do work and transfer heat. So let's say that we have a system, actually a container that contains some kind of monoatomic gas and on top of this container we have a movable piston. Okay, so this is the piston right here, and inside the container I have this monoatomic gas. So the gas atoms have some kind of velocity inside this container. And now I can do work on my system. For example, I can move this piston down. So here I have the same container, however, I move the piston down by doing work on the system. So, work done on system. 
by the surroundings, for example, by me. So what happens when I move this piston down? Actually, the piston will bump into the gas atoms inside the container. So the gas atoms start to gain a little bit more velocity. They start to bump into each other also, and the velocity of all of the atoms increases. So we can show this by the significantly larger arrows. So because the increase in velocity means that actually we increase the kinetic energy and all the energy inside the system gives us the internal energy. This overall will mean that we increased the internal energy of our system. So if the energy of the initial state defined as capital E initial and the final state is as capital E final, I know that E final is going to be larger than E initial. So if I use the formula to calculate delta E, the sign of delta E is going to be positive meaning that my system gained energy overall. And this process is also called endothermic. Endothermic. All right. Now what happens if I go backwards? So I can go from the higher energy state into the lower internal energy state by the system doing work on the surroundings. So work done by the system, by the system in this case. Here, this side is going to be my initial state, and this is the internal energy of my final state, right? Because I went backwards. So in this case, my final internal energy is actually smaller than my initial internal energy. So this means that when I calculate delta E, I'm going to end up with a value that has a negative sign because I take final minus initial. These type of processes are actually called exothermic. Okay, so I hope it makes sense so far. Now, since we said that energy is the ability to do work and transfer heat, what happens when I start transferring heat between two different systems? In my initial container right here, I'm going to have a monoatomic gas with some kind of gas velocity, and then I can add heat to the system. What happens when I add heat to the system? As we are adding heat, we are actually going to increase the temperature of the gas inside the container. So if we increase the temperature, what happens to the kinetic energy? It will also increase, right? Because at this point, as I added the heat into my container, my atoms will start moving way, way faster, right? So this is adding heat. What happened to the internal energy in this case? Is the final energy of my system larger or smaller than the E initial? It is indeed larger, right? So when I'm adding heat, I'm going to end up with a change in internal energy that is going to have a positive sign. So this is going to be an endothermic process, just like in the case when I did work on the system. Can I go backwards? Yeah. So if I go backwards, this means that the system loses heat. So if I compare the initial internal energy 
with the final internal energy. My final internal energy is actually going to be smaller. So again, I'm going to end up with a process where the change in internal energy is going to be negative. So I'm going to have an exothermic process. So as I go in both of these cases, from left to right, I am going to increase the internal energy of the system. And as I go backwards, I'm going to decrease the internal energy of the system via an exothermic process. Since energy is defined as the ability to do work and transfer heat, there is another way of calculating the change in internal energy. So the change in internal energy also equals to work, which is defined as W plus Q, which is heat. Okay, I know that there is no letter Q in heat. However, Rudolf Clausius defined it in 1850 with this letter, and we just kept it by convention. All right, so just like the change in internal energy can have either a positive or a negative sign, both work and heat can have either a positive or a negative sign. So let's summarize it on the next slide in a table. If work is done on the system and the system gains energy, both quantities are going to have a positive sign. If work is done by the system and the system is losing heat, we are going to have a negative sign for work and heat. Think about it this way. Let's say that you have an old car that you would like to sell. You are selling it for $2,000. Your bank account is going to be our system. So if someone buys your car, you are going to get $2,000 on your bank account. So it's going to gain money. The same thing happens when work is done on the system or the system gains heat. Those are always going to be positive processes. However, if you are the one who is buying the car and the system is still your bank account, you are going to take off $2,000 and give it to someone else. So you are doing the work right? The work is done by the system and you are losing heat. Now, if you have a net loss of energy, we are going to have also a negative sign next to the change in internal energy. And if you have a net gain of energy, we are going to have a positive sign next to the internal energy. When we have a net gain, those processes are called endothermic. And when we have a net loss, those processes are called exothermic. Now, something very important here to mention. These are conventions that chemists use. So we always look at everything from the point of view of the system. In physics, the convention is different, and they look at everything from the point of view of the surroundings. So remember, in chemistry, we are always looking at the system, what is happening to the system. All right, so let's do a quick example. We know that the change in internal energy can be calculated if we add work and heat together. So what happens when we have a system that loses 780 joules of heat to the surroundings? Will the sign of heat be positive or negative? We are losing heat, so this is going to have a negative sign. And then the surroundings will do work, 280 joules of work on the system. Will the work have a positive or a negative sign? Well, because the surrounding does the work on the system, right? Work is going to have a positive sign. So what is the change in internal energy for the system? We can use our formula and simply plug in the number. So delta E equals W, which is our work with a positive sign. So 280 joules plus Q, which is heat. 
uh, and it has a negative sign because the system is losing the energy. So plus minus 780 joules. What is the delta E? If you do the calculation, you are going to get minus 500 joules. So overall, we had a net loss of energy by the system, and we are having an exothermic process with minus 500 joules of energy loss. Okay, I hope this makes sense. We are going to talk more about energy, heat, and all that good stuff in the upcoming videos. See you there.